So uh, we kind of just get into it. Um, so uh, thank you, Matt, for joining me on, uh, on the stream. And I appreciate you taking some time to talk with me. Um, definitely wanted to get into talking a little bit about the NA amateur scene. Um, it's really exciting right now to see everything going on in amateur development and, you know, what's been happening in the league community as a whole this year. It's been really, really exciting um, from me being in the kind of the outside of looking at it just as a viewer, too. But let's talk a little bit about yourself. So, you know, describe, you know, you know who you are, what you do, and uh, go from there. Yeah, right. Um, my name's Matt. So I've been coaching league or league related stuff for about, this is my third year. Um, but I haven't always been involved with teams. I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching um, and a lot of habit-based coaching because in my personal experience, I used to be very, very bad at league and I'm still pretty bad. But um, I made a big jump in a very short amount of time. I went from gold two to diamond two in about wow. two weeks, what? a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that was where, like, I mean, people even at a challenger level weren't like, okay, this guy's legit. Like, he, he's he's a beast at the game. But they were like, clearly, he understands how to learn, or he understands how to do something different to to you know change my results. Because I was gold for three years before that. Hmm. So, um, I guess I just worked on that for a long time. So I was helping players who you know, want to take the game seriously, um, but don't really have any direction. They have a lot of time, but they don't know how to spend it. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was trying to help people turn that solo queue grind into something a bit more productive. And then I worked with teams here and there, but I was never very good analytically, and that's still a problem for me. But this year I started working with uh, Winthrop University, and I'm now coaching their collegiate slash amateur team, and we've been participating in all the, the circuits, so that's been good. Yeah, doing fairly well. Uh, so, sorry about your, your loss today, but... Oh, it's all right. It happens. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's exciting, though. I mean, you guys have played really well. I think you've surprised a lot of top-tier amateur and academy teams even. So um, you can definitely see the improvement. Uh, jumping from gold to diamond is insane, actually. For for anyone who's played League for any significant amount of time, I'm, I've am i been hard stuck in silver for about three years. So I, I I totally understand the pain of like not feeling like you know how to get out of your, your, your division. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think changed the most for you to allow you to make that huge of a jump? Um, so I was I was already friends with with some pro players and stuff here in, mm -hmm. in Australia. And I was out at dinner with a couple of them and, and I was like, man, like to, to the jungler of the team that I was hanging out with, I was like, man, like, come on, I play jungle. I suck. Like, how do I, how do I get better? And he looks at my OPGG. He's like, man, please play less of the game. Like, just go outside a bit, like start doing other things between your matches, all of that. Um, and so I was like, <laughs> okay, fair. Like, you know, right on. I can't just be like slamming my head against the game and expecting to improve, but also just kind of in that. I, I realized that there are so many learning behaviors that, that I've applied to learning other things, you know, academics, normal, normal stuff. I'm in university that I, I just wasn't applying or putting effort into at all with league. I would just sit there and play the game, which is fine if you just want to play. But I think it was kind of, it was somewhat dishonest of me to sit there and be like, I'm doing everything I can to get better at the game and I'm not improving. When in reality, I knew that there were like 20 things maybe that I could, could change. So I just started trying to identify those and, and change like bit by bit things that I knew I could be doing better. And then it worked out. That's, that's amazing. So, so small incremental changes, identifying just little things one at a time. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the biggest thing was understanding that I had a, a, a kind of peak performance, like time in the day I was like, <laughs> okay, I feel the best and I'm playing far better. Um, you know, maybe early afternoon when I've got all this energy, um, and then I was like, okay, so I can either only play during this kind of short time or I can work to extend that and, and work to kind of make sure that I, I have more stamina, I have more energy. And so everything kind of trickled down from that. I was just finding out what the contributing factors were and trying to tick them off and stuff. That's awesome. I, it's really interesting that you say that uh, you look at it as the time that you're playing your best. Because I, I think I've had the similar experience where I noticed that my games are generally better at certain times in the day, but I attributed it to... Uh, the cues are better, you know, like there's just better, oh, yeah. better players yeah. playing at that time. Better players, or, good yeah. time, avoiding the like after school hours yeah. where you just get. So I think, I think I found because, because I totally buy into like a ton of that as well. Yeah. And especially in, in like a, a kind of tier as, as small population wise as like high diamond Oceania, um, you run into the same guys over and over again. And so sometimes you're mm -hmm. like, oh man, it's like, it's creature hours. Like everyone online <laughs> right now, it's just like, it's just deranged. So, so I, I definitely understood that like 
that was a part of it is that like i want to avoid getting bad teammates but i think the the thing that that stood out to me the most is like in maybe 95 percent of my games in gold a better player wins those like a better a, a challenger player always wins those yeah um and and to me you can sit there and be like well the difference between me and him is that i'm challenger well he's challenger and i'm not but what does that actually mean? I was yeah. like, yeah, that's they're what, doing I mean, things. They're that's what I love about things. League, though. I mean, if, a, if yeah. a challenge level player plays a champion with no mechanics, right? Like a Leona. I mean, there's some Leona mm. mechanics, but it's not like Lee Sin. So they play yeah. Leona. They can make that champion be in the right place at the right time all the time. And yeah. absolutely, they can carry a game, which is crazy. You know, and it's not yeah. like the, the champion's any faster, stronger, you know, has more armor. It, it's just they play it better. So I, I think yeah. I love that about League. Because when you compare it to other games, right, like Valorant or CSGO, I, I physically can't do some of the things that these people are doing. Like, it's just I'm not going to yeah. hit that flick. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I love that mentality of like, you know, it's, it's true. You know, um, someone mm. else I talked to as well, a high level pro player. You know, said, well, I look at it like this. If if I was in the same situation that you were in 20 minutes into this game, would I be able to carry this game? Or would Faker be able to carry this game, whereas you couldn't? And if, mm. if so, mm. then obviously you just have to play it differently. It's it's not, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, so, and then how did you uh, get affiliated with Winthrop from all the way from down there? <laughs> um, So, around the end of last year, I was kind of considering quit not really quitting esports but just not pursuing it really um because mm. i'm i'm in the last year of my psych degree or science degree um here in sydney you know i've got other avenues there are other things that i could do and uh, the opl just got shut down so our yeah. professional league was was not going to be a thing anymore um luckily we have a new one now but um so i was like okay you know maybe for now at least i put this on the back burner and then the maryville university scouting combine was announced and that was just like a, a place where both oceanic players and american players can try out and there would be other coaches there and stuff and so i'd always been a bit of a spectator to um you know amateur collegiate etc in in na because it's a bit more interesting than here and so i was just like yeah i'll just show up and uh, and see i wasn't really looking to to you know impress anyone or, or get picked up i was just sort of hanging out and meeting people and um I was curious about the level of play, but like the difference between top American players and top Australian players, I was, I was curious or oceanic players, sorry, New Zealand exists as well. Um, <laughs> PC here. But yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I just kind of showed up and, and was there and chatted with some directors and I was just kind of hanging out being myself. And then when I announced, Hey, actually I kind of do want to do this in, in 2021, you know, I'll look for some amateur opportunities maybe. I got reached out to by a few people and uh, and one of them was just from Winthrop. So that looked like the best opportunity based on the people they had and the people I'd be working with. So yeah, awesome. it's been great. Yeah. So so did they, I mean, you had conversations with them, obviously. Was there a sort of like interview process to determine your ability to coach or game knowledge, that kind of stuff? So there was never like a formal kind of interview so the, the director had obviously seen me chat with players about the matches in the combine so he mm. had a general idea at least of how i conducted myself as a coach um but there was no kind of like uh oh, you must tick all of these boxes you mm. must have these skills which mm. um i've also tried out for for academy positions and there has been that and it was more rigid and i was like wow i'm i'm way out of my depth like, I'm, <laughs> I'm terrible so i think i think i i had multiple chats with the director um josh his name is he's he's awesome mm -hmm. um and i had to make it very clear and and i think i should i should probably say it again here i am not anywhere near as strong as a majority of the, the coaching staff in in an amateur or in in collegiate there are some guys that just have incredible minds for the game um and i think i have my merits but i'm not there yet there's a lot of work that i need to do and i made it clear that if i was to to join winthrop um i would be learning alongside the players i would have to have a lot of learning to do and so that's why i was like is there a way I can be an assistant coach? Can I work under someone who has a very strong mind for the game? And Josh, based on, I guess, what he'd seen of me and how he received my personality, was like, yeah, sure, why not? That's so, awesome. <laughs> that's that's yeah. great. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I follow a few very, very accomplished coaches uh, on Twitter and stuff, and seeing some of the stuff that they post were... They'll, they'll show like a 30 a 10 second clip and i'd be like what's wrong with this and i'm like i have no mm. idea <laughs> you know like, yeah. uh, 
Oh, Viore, yeah, and that's one of them actually. Um, so yeah, yeah, uh, yeah uh, you know, Kelsey Moser, uh, Peter Dunn, like they'll post these things that are situational, you know, things mm-hmm. in league that are like, okay, should I teleport back? Should I push this wave? Should I do? And like, there's so many things that, to play it there, and it's like, I, I, it blows my mind. You know, obviously I'm a silver league yeah. player. I'm not even thinking beyond like, what does this champion do? Um, mm. But do you find that? Uh, well, first off, is that your goal? Is to get into higher level coaching yeah i think as like now that i've committed to this now this is something that i've decided that i want to do and as i see kind of the people around me like the players i get to work with the guys like doxa chan kenji mm-hmm. all of those guys they all want to be the best like they, yeah. they work really really hard and so i think if i'm working in that in that kind of atmosphere i may as well and when i look at the guys like jensen you know kelsey moza Bayora, all, all, all the guys on twitter that, that are posting about stuff like that um the the conceptual framework they have for for like processing things about the game and then also for delivering that to people is is really really advanced Mm -hmm. like it's super high level and the thing that's different between like league and psychology is that there's no textbooks Mm -hmm. right there's no one place where you can find all of your information and be told how to think about something um and so that is is the struggle but it is my goal i want to be able to not only you know reach that level and and develop an understanding like that but uh, I'm very into journaling. I'm very into to taking note of, of my kind of process in things because I think I'm the most regular guy like in the world. Like I have no, I, I don't have any special talents. There's no genetic advantage to, to, you know, climbing League of Legends. I don't know, like, like I have the, the privilege of, of my life and my current situation going for me and that's kind of it. And so if I can, you know, figure something out that I'm passionate about and, and kind of note the process of that then that is helpful not only to myself but to the people around me absolutely you're, you're the definition of hard work getting you where to where you to where you want to be which is uh i think something that a lot of coaches try to impart on their players right i think there's a lot of players who are definitely very talented but mm. to to separate you know amateur from professional and i don't mean amateur as in you know uh, league of legends amateur i meant truly amateur like a casual yeah. player from a professional mm. It's really the amount of work that they put in. I mean, there's plenty of players who I've talked to that were very talented, but then I've met plenty who were like, yeah, I was hard stuck silver for a couple of years. I was grinding. I've learned as much as I could. Now I'm, you know, top 100 mm-hmm. challenger. And uh, I think it league is one of those things where not only is it very, very difficult to understand conceptually anyway at any static point, but it's a game that's constantly changing which mm. makes it even more difficult to really wrap around, right? Like if you have a very, very set way of looking at the game, Within two months, it's already outdated, which yeah, is it's irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, yeah. So, what are the challenges for you in terms of staying on top of the patches, staying on top of all the numbers, and like you know when they Ooh. adjust things? Yeah. So, if I'm honest, the the hardest thing is is juggling just like life and motivation, and and then like getting things done. Like I've always been very bad at getting things done. <clears throat> um, I wish there was some sort of hack to make myself super motivated all the time. But Coffee. yeah, that's, that's the, that is the biggest battle. Yeah, really, yeah. I mean, caffeine, <laughs> abuse, look, it's great. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so, so actually just sitting down and getting things done has always been a struggle. And I think it's a big battle for anyone that's like very online, especially from a young age. Yeah. Like we're kind of trained to have short attention spans now because that's how we make the most money for, for companies by consuming ads, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think just sitting down and actually sticking to it is, is super difficult. And then creating my own structures where I don't see them is, is like the biggest challenge. Like I was, I was talking about the, the kind of super complex, like conceptual stuff, right? Mm-hmm. If, you don't have, if you don't have a general framework for, for how that works, um, like, like for example, the word tempo gets thrown around all the time, but it's absolutely irrelevant if you don't have a concept of value in, in the game. Like right. if, if you don't have strong understanding of, of how much th- different things are worth and then how much different things are worth changes based on what champions are in the game, who, mm-hmm. you know, at what stage we're, in, we're into the game. So it, it, it kind of gets incredibly complex. And then when I met with a new concept or a new buzzword that just does not click with me at all, uh, it takes me quite a while to unravel. That, that's what, that was going to be my next question is like, how do you study for this stuff? How can you prepare? Do you talk to other coaches? Do you, you know... Do you just yeah. Google stuff? <laughs> I feel like I've learned yeah. half of what I know from Google. So, yeah, I think I think so. What you get when when you ask someone or when you look something up is you get like kind of the the, the explanation, and then you kind of have to build your own understanding like off of that. It, mm-hmm. it kind of you work it backwards, and so usually you'll start off like you, all coaches do this. No, like 
people could probably claim otherwise, but every coach does this. You start off with a half-assed version of someone else's opinion or someone else's <laughs> understanding. Like you really do. And I mean, as long as you're not like shilling it and claiming that, you, you know, you're, you're the, the next coming of LS or whatever, and, mm-hmm. and you understand everything totally, I think that's fine. But so I start off with, with something that's been told to me, um, a breakdown that I've seen, something that, that confused me in general, or that I don't totally understand. And then I try to build my own version of that understanding, which will usually be flawed and kind of, you know, a, a baby version. So mm-hmm. I did this with drafting earlier this year. I had no idea how to draft. Um, I was given some, some pointers on how to prepare, what to look for, all of that. And then from there, you just have to be conscious of every challenge and keep asking questions. So why did I get absolutely destroyed in this draft? Why was this draft bad? Those sort of questions keep building onto your original understanding until hopefully you have a kind of complete one. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. I noticed that sometimes, you know, drafts, uh, I don't know which leagues you follow, maybe all of them, but LEC had oh. some, like the Shaka draft was absolutely insane. And it was, yeah. it was I mean, if, if you look it up, uh, have you seen it? Or the, the Shaka versus... Uh, uh, Shaka versus... I think they played... Who was it? But they, they played a Nocturne mid. And oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, the entire draft is basically around throwing this Nocturne into any enemy champion that was alone and, like, Karthus ulting right after. It was just absolutely Yeah, okay. Absolutely we had insane. that run against us this morning, actually. Uh, and maybe somebody saw it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, I mean, yeah, it's great. Uh, but like that level of creativity, right? Because it, it, obviously that draft is designed to play in a very specific way, and the players have to know that. Um, mm. Do you come up with, like, it seems almost like a pocket pick, like you would practice that a couple times and just have it. Um, but then the meta traditionally is, is very much like, okay, let's set up our front line. Let's set up, is this a dive comp or a poke comp? And you just kind of go from there. Yeah. Um, do you do a lot of creativity in your drafts or do you kind of follow like, like, this is what the right way to play should be? Uh, I think for me, like the creativity, right. Um, you keep that to, well, you don't leave it to, to, to the smarter people, but as in, I, I don't consider myself like at a level yet to, to be truly creative and mm. to be re- really pushing the kind of, you know, in terms of art, someone who, who can paint beautifully, like if you ask them to paint something, right, they'll, they'll be able mm. to, they'll be able to kind of make their own version of it. They have, they have their own artistic style. <clears throat> they've, they've got a kind of wealth of knowledge to, to fall back on. So I think drafting is much the same and theory crafting in general is, is much the same. Like, mm. um, Oh, why does he why does he slip my mind? The Korean player that's incredibly experimental with um uh, you know, uh, he ran Predator well, Aatrox or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, stuff like that. Yeah. I was thinking Doom B too, like playing just Oh yeah, crazy, of course, Doom B like crazy you know, mids, pulled yeah. out Norton mid on Chobi, the world stage. Yeah. Like, you know. So so those guys that are that are being truly creative and, and really like pushing things have super, super intimate understandings of, of why they're doing that and what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And so Right now, I am I am pretty limited in terms of draft. I would say, um, and you can probably see it in in like if you look through the Winthrop drafts, like it's it's fairly one dimensional, and that's why uh, teams that see right through us and just kind of pick you know their own style and and play very well um, are good. I think I think teams that are less confident and teams that are less uh, they they don't have as much experience will probably always be like meta locked, right? Mm-hmm. So so drafting mm-hmm. to the meta, picking OPs, banning OPs, all of that, but. Mm-hmm. I think most notably our recent matchup against uh, Evil Geniuses Prodigies. They don't care about patch OPs. They just play their own game. Like they they were just crushing it. Yeah. Um. And so that's kind of a level I want to be on. Like where where my understanding of the draft concepts is good enough that we can like you know weasel out picks that are maybe a little avant garde or or we can just do something that's completely unexpected. Mm-hmm. But I'm not there yet. Yeah, I, I actually love that metaphor that you use of, of comparing it to art, right? I, I was actually a trained artist prior to college. Um, and one of the things that one of my favorite teachers would always stress with us is you can't learn to paint until you learn how to draw because mm. your painting will always look off if you haven't drawn it correctly. So you could have the most beautiful technique in the world and it wouldn't matter if the actual framework around that painting is off, right? The, yeah. the, the lines are skewed or whatever. So it, it's kind of like what you're saying is that you have to develop that foundation first before you can get really creative and have it work. Otherwise, yeah, you'll yeah. throw a bunch of stuff out there that people are like, wow, that's really off meta and it just falls apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some terrible, there's some really bad like, rogue <laughs> picks, right? I mean, yeah. there, there, have been some, there have been some really crazy ones in the history of League. And you can tell when a team has done something for a incredibly good but really weird reason mm-hmm. or like they've just kind of done it 
to mm-hmm. do it. Like Rakan mid has been picked like a couple times in the history of pro. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, sure. Um, so what do you, what do you think, uh, about, well, now that you have an experience in NA and OCE, what do you think about the difference between those two regions? Is it closer than you expected? Is it greater? Um, I think it's really like a difference in, in atmosphere. I mean, I can't speak for the, for the very top level of, of Oceania because as much as I know some of the players, whatever, I've never coached like OPL or, or LCO at that level. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I think the mindset of, of a lot of like top Oceanic players is quite different to, to the mindset of other people who would be considered prospects for, for LCS or Academy hmm. in that, um, here, if you commit to, to doing esports, like you commit pretty hard it's Mm -hmm. there's there's not really other options um it's there's there's no there's very few college scholarships for for esports or or anything related to that um and so some of these guys don't have backup plans at all and so their life is is pretty much like hinging on them succeeding in esports so they work insanely hard like very very hard and that's why a lot of the guys that are in na now um are doing quite well those those are the guys that have been just busting their asses just working super hard but skill wise i think once you hit Challenger, it's pretty homogenous between NA and Oceania. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think probably below that, the the skill level kind of drops off in yeah. in OS because we're a low popular like low population region. There's just not that much like competition, or whatever. But the guys at the top of Challenger definitely would would be competing in NA the exact well, same. I think you've seen a, a lot of that this year, especially with OC, OC becoming a part of NA, essentially, mm. in terms of uh, mm. region, right? Um, yeah, how how yeah. exciting is it for you to see all these uh, Oceanic players coming over? It's, it's sick. It's really cool to see yeah. a bunch of the guys that... Because some of these guys debuted or started, like, right as I started taking an interest in esports or, mm-hmm. or started taking an interest in coaching when I was, like, I was genuinely just... a. a 17 year old kid that, that was like oh <laughs> video games are cool yeah um so so seeing them succeed is is really cool and seeing the guys like once again in such an unstable region these guys have, have taken a massive chance mm-hmm. um and so seeing them succeed is really really cool yeah i, I mean I've, I've met a few of them right cloud nine has a, a bunch of oceanic players now um mm. but they're all really really down-to-earth people super nice people um i love that they have you know, every Oceanic player I've met is funny because when they, they talk, they all know each other first off, right? Because they're mm, all from the mm. same region. So they always talk very highly of each other. Like, mm. you know, uh, like FBI was talking really highly of Rayoma and like, you know, yeah. it's just all yeah. around, all around, like Shurnfire and, uh, you know, King. Mm. Um, it, it seems like they, they there's a lot of like, well, we're from Oceanic. So like, even though we're all on different teams, they all kind of support each other mutually too, because yeah. they're in NA technically. And, mm. you know, it's challenging. You're coming into a very, very competitive scene where... You know, I think we're starting to see a little bit of a shift. A lot of the uh, older legends have now retired or, you know, yeah, moved yeah, on. So, new, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of an open open territory now. Mm. Um, so when you approach, you know, players from different regions, is there a difference in terms of how you would try to build that culture in the teams that you you know work with? And Ooh. Well, I think American players kind of think that Australians are funny, right? Like, they're like, oh, I, like I like his accent. Oh, I like the way he. Yeah. So, I That's think true. something that I something that I've done historically when I'm working with people is is yeah. I don't I don't try to like come off as as more than I am or like kind of put myself above them, even though I'm the coach. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's like I mean, for starters, I'm the same age as most of the guys that I'm coaching, right? I'm not their senior. Um, they've done you know the same amount, if not more, than me in esports as well. So. I think approaching them as, as an equal and just like kind of creating a, a general environment in which people are ready to to play as a team, like play together, like everyone enjoys it and mm-hmm. is happy doing it um, and, and ready to learn and actually like understand what hard work means. Those are the two things that are important to me. And I think I used to set the tone a little too casual. I used to be a bit too much of a jokester um, and I'd, I'd mess around a lot. And I think you still need to keep it at a level where your players can respect you. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's very important. The, the respect and trust, even if they don't like, they don't need to think that you're just like a genius or anything. But mm-hmm. if they if they have basic respect and trust and, and faith in your ability to you know do what you say, work hard, um, then that's the most important to me. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, that's a struggle I think at every level, especially in esports, because uh, there's just not that that inbuilt. I guess, respect for authority, like in traditional mm. sports where, you know, if a kid's been playing soccer, football, 
from the time they were five until they're in college or at pro, you know, they've been indoctrinated their entire life to think of the coach as the guiding figure. I listen to what coach says. It's always yes, coach, you know, and then in esports, like you got a whole bunch of people who played very, very high level at this game and they're on their own essentially in solo queue. And then now they're put in an organization and someone's telling them how to play. It's tough, Mm. especially because I think most coaches actually are not challenger level players. Yeah. anymore yeah. right a lot of them anymore, were yeah. f- former pros or like previously mm. challenger but most of the coaches i know don't play challenger anymore you know they're all like diamond um mm, mm. so i think it's mainly a time commitment thing like they just don't have the hours to spend yeah, playing a lot. Like, yeah. <laughs> to get to that yeah. level but um so i think that's been a struggle i've seen even on lcs teams sometimes with like how do you as a diamond player technically tell a high level challenger you know top in the lcs or whatever how to play their mm. champion or how to mm. play the map differently. It's, yeah. I think that's a struggle. Yeah. Um, that's something that is going to have to get resolved organizationally, but yeah, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's all about trying to create respect and then have them actually understand that you're coming from a place of trying to help them, not like tell them how to play. Yeah. You know? I think a super important distinction to make mm-hmm. is also like in theory, you want to be working with the best team in the world. Like you want your players to be the best players in the role in the world. And so if that is the case, you are never going to be able to tell a top laner how to play top lane, for example. Yeah. Like because because they're the best, they right. they're going to know better than you. Right. But if you can work with them on how they think about things or how they understand things and develop that mm-hmm. and make sure that that's what you're developing. You're not developing just like I will teach you how to play, you know, Aatrox into Renekton or something. Yeah. It's more like you and I will work out the most effective way of thinking about this matchup and what we can point to and you know what you can communicate to your team. Uh, I think that's that's still something that someone who even has like a kind of poor understanding of the game initially can probably eventually provide to even top players. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That that's really interesting because then that that also if you can maybe open their eyes to looking at a situation differently, that that expands everything. And maybe they have the potential then to look at okay, they actually learned something that applies in six different matchups, not just this one. Um, mm. That that's really interesting. Um, how do you, uh, what, what, what's been the greatest challenge for you so far? Um, figuring out what I need to, what I need to learn, like what actually has to change for me as a coach to, mm. for me to, for me to perform at this level, because the moment I'm given an opportunity like this, the first, the first thing or the kind of constant thought is like, don't mess this up. Like <laughs> I, I get to work with these great players, right? These guys are, these guys are the highest level players that I've, that I've gotten to work with as a team before. And it is my duty then to, to help them succeed however I can. Mm-hmm. And so I don't have time to, to like get ego about it or, or to worry about, you know, what people think of me. It's all just, am I doing enough for these players and what do I need to be doing next? And so the first thing was draft. That was really obvious. I was like, haha, I need to learn how to draft. Let's do that. But from there, it, it's, it gets more and more complicated. Right now we're at a point at which it's like I can facilitate the team playing and, and performing on stage, whatever, but I can't facilitate their learning as well as I need to be for us to compete with these other teams. And that's why I think we, you know, we lost today or we didn't make it to Proving Grounds is because I can, like these guys naturally learn a lot. They're, they're very fast learners and they play great as a team mm-hmm. and they're always open to discussion, but I need to figure out what we can put in place to make sure that they're learning even faster and leveling up faster. So that's kind of nebulous. It's hard yeah. to uh, to figure it out exactly. But yeah, that's that's been the greatest challenge, I reckon. Yeah, creating systems is, is definitely the most difficult thing. Um, do you guys have uh, other staff on set, like, like sports psychology, um, positional coaches, anything like that? Uh, so we don't really... I'm I'm the assistant coach. We have another coach um, named Ben Fruitcake. Mm-hmm. He's also from Australia, mm-hmm. um, and he does one-on-one work with the players. And it's my understanding also that the players have one-on-one sessions with other coaches or, or people that are playing their role at a high level. Um, in terms of like solo queue games, or if there's a vod where one player clearly just just underperformed, we usually go like, "Hey, is there anyone you can look over this with?" Um, in terms of psychology side of things. I think the university has sports psychologists for their like sports programs, but mm-hmm. we don't have one for the team. We don't have like a kind of direct sort of thing. So in terms of support stuff, it's it's pretty bare bones. Our manager sticks around a lot. She's she's awesome and she she likes talking to the players and putting in a lot of work to make sure that things are more structured. But mm-hmm. 
no, we don't have like a kind of extensive uh, stuff base. I Interesting. Guess. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I always uh, I always ask that with universities, especially. I've met uh, players from you know other teams and other games like Valorant, some other ones, and that's that question I always ask them because I think you're right. Universities actually have access to that stuff more easily than almost any other amateur team. Um, most pro amateur teams, right? If they're owned by org, they have to hire a sports psychologist to come in and do all that. I think most schools actually, you're right, have it on campus. And usually if it's a club sport or it's clearly a sport that the school is supporting, um, mm -hmm. I'd imagine it wouldn't be that hard to, you know, just talk to someone like, Hey, can you come and just see what's going on? Maybe give us some pointers. Yeah. Um, cause yeah. a lot of times for uh, my experience, I think the sports psychologist is one of the most, um, culturally gr uh, ground changing positions that you could have because he could they could basically transform how you, like you said how you look at a problem not not necessarily mm. here you guys need to do this you need to talk like this it's more about look, let's look at the big picture stuff right like what how are we interacting as teammates how do we you know juggle the stresses of college life and and competing yeah yeah, um, yeah. And that was gonna be my next question actually is that how do you juggle your schedule because you're not only doing the college plus coaching plus i mean you're on the other side of the world so your time zone mm. is completely flipped yeah yeah so it's uh it's somewhat challenging i just have to make some sacrifices sometimes mm -hmm. uh just like you know early nights uh doesn't like you know not going out as much mm -hmm. uh things like that but usually it depends on on when scrims are because academy teams scrim from uh i believe in california time like midday to 5 p.m or something yeah, yeah. um so it's a five hour block and for me midday to 5 p.m in Cali is like uh like 4 a.m onwards i think mm -hmm. I, I can't i you know i'm probably getting that wrong and also daylight savings just took over for the <laughs> yeah, states, it, which so. makes absolutely no sense but yeah <laughs> yeah look i'm not and, and and daylight savings is going to tick over in australia next month and so it's, everything's going to be another hour earlier for me so um <laughs> anyway that's but but yeah so i i usually wake up quite early in the morning and that's fine because i like that as as how my day starts i i wake up i'm able to get like kind of work done, mm -hmm. like work, you know, I sit in on scrims or we have a match day or whatever. And then I go on about my, my regular human life because as, as cool as being coach ginseng on the internet is I'm quite a fan of the real world as well. You know, I've got a lot going on outside <laughs> of the computer. And so, um, it's nice to have that sort of disconnect. So it works, it works out all right. Usually if I can schedule my classes for the afternoon, it's not a worry, but okay. Uh, this semester, I do have some days where I just have to be like, either we can't scrim or I'm going to be absent, which that definitely sucks. I don't like yeah. missing scrims or anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so how, you said you're finishing this year with your mm. degree? In theory. Yeah, that's the plan. Um, <laughs> assuming you assuming, pass? <laughs> well, just assuming I meet credit point requirements because oh, it's all okay. a bit kind of uh, yeah iffy, especially with my minor. I'm not sure exactly which units count towards a Japanese studies minor because I, I, I've been doing consistent Japanese language throughout mm -hmm. my degree. But um, yeah, it's just all, you know, uni admin stuff that's a bit stressful. Yeah, but should be right. <laughs> what, what are you planning after? Are you planning on staying there or moving to the States? Um, I don't have an immediate plan. Like I'm not really like fully subscribed to anything. I'm not sitting here being like, well, you know, I got to be got to be going to the US. But yeah. That would be, I think that would be the ideal. I would like to, I have a lot of growing to do. And that's what I was like, okay, 2021, like I want to make sure that by the end of this year, I am good enough as, as a, you know, staff that there will be just offers for me. Like I won't have to worry about whether whether or not there are, because I will be at that level. So that's the goal for this year. And then hopefully by next year, I'll have the option to go to the US. I would like, I would like to probably coach collegiate again, um, mm -hmm. but actually from the States and maybe just study at a university there as well. Mm -hmm. I'd like to keep learning languages. So if I can do that for a couple of years or if there are opportunities beyond that, um, I think that'd be great. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's, it's really cool to see that esports is opening doors for people, you know, in ways that I don't think a lot of people, I mean, I for sure would never have guessed I'd be somehow working in professional esports. Like that was such mm -hmm. a crazy dream from when I was a kid. Um, I tell mm -hmm. players all the time, I'm 34. I'm like, Look, you guys are living my dream from when I was like 12. I just grew up a decade too early to even have been yeah. a part of it. Like, you know, at any any level, I wasn't that good. But, <laughs> you know, as a kid, I grew up, I, played, I played so many video games growing up. I was always like, I wish you could actually make money doing this. It'd be awesome. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. it's so cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm ecstatic for them, you know, like to see how excited some of these players are to, to get their chance to go on stage and stuff like that. It's, it's just really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what's the, been the most 
I guess, what's been your proudest accomplishment thus far? Oh, man. My proudest accomplishment. Um, do you mean with Winthrop or just... Oh, it doesn't general? even have to be esports specific. Just say, what are you most proud of and, and what okay. you've done? Um, so, some of the players that I've worked with over the years, uh, because because I, I did a lot of habit coaching and I did a lot of discussing what it meant to work hard at a video game. Um, some of the players I work with just quit gaming. like Or like at least quit pursuing it competitively. Um, and those guys like usually have realized that maybe it was a bit of a crutch or it was something that they're not kind of into. Um, and so probably some of my proudest stuff is just, is just hearing from those guys being like, yeah, my life's really good. Um, I have a super healthy relationship with the internet now. Nice. Um, and that's nice. I think obviously, you know, if we make proving grounds, if we, if we start knocking over these huge teams, then that'd be the first thing that comes to mind where I'm yeah. just like, hell yeah, man, we, we smashed TSM. Like, let's go. <laughs> um, yeah. but for now, I think, I think those, those, those relationships that I built with those individuals and the, you know, even though I'm not like a, I'm not not qualified to to help people as a profession, but that I was able to to you know help them help themselves is uh is yeah. nice. Good helping people is always a good feeling. I think that's really mm. what drew me into my career is that at the end of the day, you know, my job is to help people, and I think yeah. that always makes it so that you don't go home ever having a bad day. It's always you know you have stressful days and you have days where things mm. didn't go well, but it's never a bad day because in the end it's like yeah. you know somebody left feel left my presence feeling a little bit better about themselves or something you know have less pain. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know amateur. I think this has been a huge huge topic this year and i don't know if it's only because i started using twitter this year or if it truly has just really blown mm. up this year but the whole discussion between how do we improve na solo queue how do we improve the player base how do we get na out of you know uh, play-ins <laughs> hopefully mm. group stage um you know like what do you think about the, the amateur to academy to lcs pathway right now oh okay that's that's a interesting question so the debate has been happening for for quite a while mm -hmm. um especially on twitter the you know every year after worlds the kind of the fires get yeah get stoked again and everyone's like man we need to fix our region and <laughs> i was an outsider looking in for like the longest time so i was like oh man just like fix your shit like whatever <laughs> but, um, but it, it is it is interesting so i think that there's there's like conflicting narratives that that always surprise me like mm -hmm. people are really really uh, angry or confused whenever an academy team loses to a top amateur team but then they're also sitting there being like, oh, there's no, you know, there's just not enough talent in our region, man. Like, you know, that, that, that's, that doesn't make sense. Like no. it, it, it never, it never made sense to me. So I think what is happening right now with proving grounds and, and kind of development to, to amateur, you know, the LCS orgs expanding downwards, um, I think is hugely important and it's massive for the future of the region. Um, and, and just kind of like competition in general, because if you're a player that's like maybe like mid diamond or whatever, and there's, uh, an accessible higher level of competition that you can strive for mm -hmm. that's like the most important thing so i think building that up and people understanding that that it does start lower it's not just challenger players you know like talent development means actually developing individuals and understanding that people can develop and, and get mm -hmm. a lot better um those are those are kind of like on the way in this year you know with with these developments it's getting better It'll still take time, though. Like the if you look at the development league in China, for example, the amount of infrastructure, the amount of money, all of that there, is uh is way higher. Because while we're having this discussion about, um, you know, amateur expansion, there's also the discussion about staffing and academy and the level of staffing and the level of coaching, mm -hmm. etc. So maybe there, you know, there's there's more than one issue that needs to be fixed yeah, on, yeah. on on that one, but. I think steps in the right direction for sure. Yeah, it, do, it definitely sounds that way from a lot of the players I've talked to. They, they've kind of said similar things that Academy in the past, it was an obligation and some teams took it as, okay, we can create a feeder team that we can then cultivate better talent for our, our own team, our LCS team, and then also, you know, trade players around stuff like that. There's a lot of advantage to have a really, having a really strong Academy team. But then there's definitely some organizations where Academy is just kind of this thing where they would bring in some players and then rotate them every year. Um, yeah. And I've, I've talked to players who are former academy players and they're in LCS now and they've said there, there are certain organizations where they were on teams that they felt like they got no coaching in academy, mm. which is just really sad. Mm. You know, they're like, we, we thought it was going to be a developmental thing and it was more just like, oh, you're playing in academy and yeah, you just a, practice wait. and play, practice and play. Um, mm. So I love seeing amateur compete with academy. I don't think it's really a sign that, oh, academy is weak. I, I think it just shows that there is a player base out there that's very strong because... Um, mm. 
plenty of academy players, you know, are, are top 10 in solo queue all the time, you know, and they, they're very, very good players. Um, and a lot of them have even subbed in. I mean, this year's amateur is insane. There's like half of them are LCS quality. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you know, it's all the FIDE and stuff. That's, yeah. That's, a, that's amateur. I mean, that's an academy team. So, yeah. yeah I mean, ha- half of those players went to Worlds. So mm. <laughs> it's a very high level of competition. And the fact that amateur teams are taking games off of them, maybe not taking whole series, but like taking points off of them is, is really, really mm. a good sign, I think, for the region. Mm. Um, and hopefully, yeah. like you said, it, it kind of inspires people to push from Diamond upward. Um, because that's another thing in talking with some foreign players too, they've said, you know, in Korea and in China, I, the, the talent scouts are looking at high level diamond players and they're yeah. developing them to get them ready for challenger. And then once you're in challenger, you're already talking to scouts. Like it's, it's yeah. so crazy. Um, yeah. like if you're in challenger, it means that you're ready to almost go pro and in the U S it's more like people stream to get into challenger. But, like, no organization is going to sign this player. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. Like, I mean, Challenge is just, like, a, it's full of uncut gems. Like, there's, yeah. there's a lot of players that have just, like, bashed out millions of games of League of Legends. And they're very good. But yeah. um, the step between solo queue and competitive is huge. Yeah, So absolutely. I mean, yeah. you can't you can't one-trick, really. <laughs> mm, mm, yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, that's a big one, yeah. How, how do you feel about one-tricking? Because, I mean, I know a lot of people try to one-trick in order to climb. But then at some point, like, do you... Do you it's stop great, doing that but then you, you drop <laughs> it's awesome so in season nine when i did the the gold to diamond thing mm-hmm. i was one tricking um Who'd you so play? i had been i'd been one tricking before that i was i was playing a bunch of shivana on oh, okay. my on my you know in gold struggling not really finding any success and i think one tricking is really interesting because it depends on on how you approach it so for me one tricking was just a way to to really really hone in on on what exactly i was learning from each game Mm -hmm. right because you're playing shivana not a very mechanically demanding champion um has a very clear win condition and it was all about understanding that that win con and like game flow and then making my understanding of it like way more intimate so i would be i would be talking about like in this situation how many camps do i need to give up or, or like can i contest a scuttle blah 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 if i have x so my understanding of the game as a whole got better but i was still hampered by the fact that i could only play shivana right that's always the downside is Mm -hmm. it's awesome that you've built up this uh this super intimate understanding but if it's only of one champion then it's no good competitively and it also means that your overall game understanding is still going to be weak Mm -hmm. so then i was like well is this a repeatable process so i i hit diamond playing mid i one tricked kiana and i was like okay so you can generalize the the process of learning a champion even if it, you do it one by one and and the actual process is not general at all you're like sitting there just like pouring over how to play one champ so i think one tricking has benefits in that you can learn how to learn a lot better mm-hmm. but you can't learn the entire game just playing one champion you're going to be super super yeah, so that, that's crazy then that some i mean i mean so many pro players can play so many champions at that high level of a level because you know i'll, I'll see like you know some of these guys I work with who will pull a champion out, play them four times or something during that week, and then they'll take it on stage and they look yeah. absolutely insane. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Yeah. It's just crazy. So, I mean, that, like, they've obviously got incredibly efficient, like, ways of, of building these, these, like, game plan or, or game flow understandings. And mm-hmm. that's what's, like, super impressive about those players. And obviously, just at that point, like, once you're a pro, like, you're, like, your benchmarks are just crazy. Like, you've obviously. Yeah your movement you don't need to you don't need to worry about any of those even when you're picking a champion up for the first time the moment you understand what they do it's straight into like just matchups general like kind of understanding and then and then you're there so those guys are super impressive the the mechanics are not the not the issue (laughs) oh never never. yeah it's it's so wild but then i guess also in in terms of learning the game one tricking makes sense because when you think about league of legends right it's it's 156 champions or whatever it is factorial combinations right so that's billions yeah. of combinations so if you can just pick one champion you've eliminated a massive number of those situations yeah. interactions uh specific matchups you, you just taken all those away you just like okay i can just focus on how do they interact mm. with me so yeah yeah i think it makes sense because i've definitely noticed that when in doubt i'll fall back on like you know my one or two champs that i'm really really comfortable with um because you know and, and some of the pros have even told me too is like if you want to just climb you're, you're not going pro like you know honestly yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um in order to climb it's just better to one trick because in a situation in which you might have a winning matchup if you don't know how to play that champion as well you're still going to lose so yeah. it, you're better off just going with something you know mechanically really well but yeah yeah i think as long as like 
your your kind of one trick understanding comes from you you actually building like these understandings so you're actually taking into account what is making you succeed what is making you fail mm. um, what you need to be paying attention to then you're usually still working on some sort of game fundamental that's like transferable eventually but the yeah. problem with most one tricks is they do what will just win like win them a game with no <clears throat> sort of yeah uh general respect for for why it's winning them the game or what the game actually is about so like you know people in silver just like doing like alicopter like alistar roams to mid or whatever yeah um that's like yeah it's all about the the, the mental process yeah I have, I have a buddy who's a jungler slash top main and his his only he's always just like screw my team i just want to split push like that that's yeah. the only way to win because silver <laughs> yeah. you can't trust anybody we can't win a team fight i'm just gonna split push every time the problem is like obviously there's there's times when like if you were with us we would have won that team fight but because you're split pushing like now we're gonna yeah. lose the whole game so i think the, the attitude i give is like, like for, for players in solo queue is yeah. that you have a you have a, a a chance that you will have four out of five members of your team be an idiot like a complete idiot and so you need to like for starters like the enemy team has a chance that there's five like yeah. there's five just absolute fools so you need to make sure that you're consistent enough for starters yeah. um and then also like if you have done absolutely everything you can like literally every every play that you made was perfect and you were absolutely respectful to everything happening on the map and you still weren't able to succeed then it is truly an unfortunate day and you can be sad about your teammates all you want but until mm -hmm. then until you, you like you've actually maximized your agency and then still lose uh it's always there's always something to take away from it right and and really if you were to play at that level four out of five games you're gonna win probably you know three of them easily mm, mm. yeah so, yeah i've definitely noticed that it's a lot it's really easy to blame your team especially when they do just clearly dumb stuff right like okay you're just running it down you died six times solo like come on yeah. but at the same time you know those even those games usually aren't unwinnable it's just you get tilted and you're like, well, this is lost. I'm going to start playing crazy. And yeah. and, then, and then you're yeah. the one running it down and you get reported. I speak from experience. But. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It happens to me sometimes, man. Like, you know, I, I think I think also the, the thing that, that, that always stood out to me about habits and about play and everything is that you're never training someone to be perfect 100% of the time. Right. It's always just about how they bounce back, how they, you know, how they're able to ensure that they're you know being as efficient as, as possible yeah is your so is your major psychology or do you have a specific uh yeah. sub focus yeah so i major in psychology all the units that i'm doing you don't really get to specialize in a bachelor's mm. um but you get to choose a bit more towards the end so i'm doing mostly behavioral and learning psychology Applicable. so that's good yeah I, I quite yeah i quite enjoy it yeah awesome. <laughs> yeah i was, I was wondering, have you taken any sports psych class or, or no um, I did health science classes, but I haven't done anything sports psychology okay. related. Yeah, I took one in college just as a, a psychology requirement. Um, for physical therapy prereqs, you have to take one psychology class. So actually, I did two. So I did abnormal psychology, which is really crazy. I mean, no, mm. no pun intended, but like it was interesting to learn about yeah. all those things that can change and like it, just the experience of what people go through when they have mental disorder is just fascinating yeah. um but then sports psychology is really interesting to me too because i actually uh i was coaching my so i i, I played collegiate paintball competitively wow okay. and yeah we were national champions in 2012 like we were in a really good team and in my Damn. last year of college uh or the year after i took a gap year i basically coached that year so um it was oh, really wow. cool to to go to, from the player side to the coach side and kind of going through what you did where i was like obsessive about how do I be a better coach? You know, how do I learn how to help people learn? And, you know, what's the best mm -hmm. way to motivate a team and get people to, you know, really bond? It was, it was really fascinating because um, I, I think I've always been into sports in general. Like, have you do you watch traditional sports as well or? Uh, no, but I grew up playing a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. I like, think that's actually fairly common um, in, with people in esports now, especially nowadays. I think a lot of kids mm. have grown up playing sports and gaming. You know, we see it in the pro level too. Like NBA players love playing video games. NFL players love playing video games. It's uh, it's just, I think this generation has grown up with it. So, mm. you know, it's the, the days of like, hey, I'm this nerd who like sat in my basement and played video games 20 hours a day. It, it, a lot of that's actually really not accurate anymore. I think yeah, a lot of pro yeah. players I work with have actually decent health routines. They eat well, mm. they take care of themselves, they work out. Um, I think it's really cool that health is becoming a more norm for gamers. Yeah. Um, although it could always be better, but hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. There's a lot of... <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Do you, do you uh, play any other games besides league? 
Um, I, I mean, I used to be a massive gamer, like, especially in high school, it was, it was Counter-Strike League, mm -hmm. um, just like kind of whatever random game was new popped up. Um, but now less so. Now, most of my, I, I like spending a lot more of my relaxation time not playing video games because it's work. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it all feels like sitting at the computer feels like work. So I still play a lot of solo queue. And then apart from that, I'll occasionally play Counter-Strike with my friends. And then okay. maybe my high school friends who I'm like... We're not all like super in touch. We're not like best friends anymore. Um, but whenever we hang out, it's always chill. And so maybe like once or twice a year when we're all on holiday, yeah. we all get together and play Rust for like four days. We just have <laughs> absolutely no life. And we're just we're just like, you know, just screaming at our computers. It's so fun. That's but that's nice. apart from yeah. that, not a ton of recreational gaming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. So if you're if you're stuck, you know, even even playing solo queue at some level must feel kinda like you're studying. Like you're, you're trying yeah, to see well, something specific or especially now, like I'm, I'm just trying to reach a goal. Like I want to hit like at least like masters, grandmasters mm -hmm. just for like credibility, just yeah. to be like, yeah, okay, I, I've done that. Um, and so right now, yeah, it's, it's work. Like it, I don't, I, <laughs> don't, I mean, I have fun. I love playing the game. Right. But Are it's you... not, I'm, I'm not sitting there being like, oh, this is so relaxing. Like, no. game, well, I don't think anybody, game, like, anybody ever has played league and said, this is hard. relaxing. It's, <laughs> it's never unless relaxing. You're playing, unless you're playing Yumi or oh I played a game in, of Master Yi and like silver with one of my mates last night. That was pretty relaxing. But apart from that, yeah, you're not really, <laughs> Are, are you but still, I mean, <laughs> are you still oh, a jungle main? Yeah. 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 I still, I still play pretty much only jungle i'm quite bad off roll but, uh, um, yeah yeah sorry just talking about like like habits and stuff i play every game with like an eeg reader on and a heart rate monitor oh, wow. i'm testing some i'm testing some software for like a, a new zealand based startup but very cool i get like i get like analytics on my like focus and everything and so it's not really that relaxing because i have this thing buzzing at me if i'm ever losing focus i'm like <laughs> sitting there like oh man okay we've got to stay like that's crazy yeah that's yeah. awesome. I'm, I'm actually, so I started, this, speaking of which, it's never relaxing. I started a new account this week uh, because my main account's MMR is just completely just trash. Destroyed? It's, it's, yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I'm gaining 9 to 10 and I'm losing 16, so it's just not playable. Like, yeah, it's pretty rough. That's pretty rough. I thought playable. I had it bad, but no, not. <laughs> it's not playable. So I, I, I'm silver 4. I'm just like, you know what? I was, silver, I was almost silver 1. I'm just like, let's just dump this account. I'm going to switch. Uh, so I made a new account and I started playing jungle again because I used to, I, be, I was a jungler two years ago. Um, and it's kind of fun, but literally I'm playing a blind pick. I'm level nine. And at the end of the game, I like hard carried with Hecarim because it's just broken. And this guy Rage. was just raging. Like I reported him in chat because he was like typing just, you know, <gasps> oh, F yeah, words yeah. and like calling me yeah. all these horrible, like just oh. homophobic slurs and like just listing yeah. it all that. I'm like, dude, you're in a blind pick at level nine how like yeah, yeah it's it's crazy like just have some fun yeah I mean, like this yeah. doesn't matter at all like <laughs> i think i think the thing that the thing that stood out to me was there was this streamer i can't remember exactly who it was but they were playing a game and like it was like by all definitions just an absolute tilter like just like his whole team yeah. was like sprinting it like someone at afk yeah but he was just grinning and people were like how are you still having fun and he said like this is the most like League of Legends it can get. Yeah. Right. Like you're yeah. sitting there, the only person that's performing well on your team, and you you have the potential to carry a bunch of idiots. And if you don't, it's it's fine because like yeah. you know that ultimately it's not your fault, whatever. And if you do, it feels incredible. And yeah. so I guess that's how I manage to have a lot more fun with it. Is even if I'm sitting there in like what looks like a doomed game, I'm like, all right, let's have some fun like figuring yeah. this one out. Well, let's do our absolute best. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I think, you know, I, I wish I, I tweeted this a while back, but I wished Riot would incentivize that somehow of like, if you are numerically somehow they, they have to come up with some algorithm to generate that. But if you were numerically the w top one or two best players on a losing team, you should have LP mitigation, right? Like instead mm. of losing 15, you should just lose like 10. Like even yeah. that would incentivize people to keep trying, even if they have some player just like, playing terrible like running it down you're like okay if i can at least be the best player on my team i will not lose as much i think yeah. and if all four other players are doing that you're actually going to get a better game out of it yeah you but, have five people who are trying to be the best player on their team yeah. so yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, instead they they make it so that oh i'm gonna lose this much lp anyway and this is a waste of time i'm trying to ff15 every every five minutes like um yeah yeah and, and that's actually the most for me that's personally the most tilting thing is when a game is just completely just you know gone to crap everything's dying and then you try to ff and they just one guy says no and you're like come on dude you're 0 and 12 oh, like <laughs> sorry man that's me i'm the one guy i'm like let's go boys. Let's well i mean I, I i okay i think i think if, if it's a care like if, if there's a chance sure i agree right yeah but that, yeah. i've been in games where it's like 35 to 2 
at like 15 minutes and oh. i'm just like please like we have to get it out sounds of this like a, sounds like a viego win man I don't <laughs> know what about. If, I, if i feed if i feed and i'm viego it's fine we just kill the fed guy and then i kill everyone right right <laughs> no 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 I'm, I'm i'm joking around but um yeah no i get that it's it's rough i think the most frustrating ones for me are um people like deciding to lose the game entirely based on like personality yeah like as yeah. in, as in, absolutely nothing in the game has made it not worth playing or unwinnable, yeah. and someone's just like, "Well, get tossed. I'm gonna run it down." Like, yeah, <laughs> that, or, or that frustrates like, me. For sure. how, like somebody will say something in champ select, like, "Oh, I wish you would play this champ instead," and then like, "Oh, I'm gonna run it then," and you're like, "What is wrong with you?" It's crazy. It's <laughs> like, crazy. I mean, yeah. I I can never play with like the ID like Jin Seng Hai, even though that's my my name on on pretty much everything. Um, I don't play with that ID because when my name is is recognizably me. There are people who are just like like people that I've never interacted with in my mm-hmm. life, but they've they've seen my name. Like they have they have heard of me potentially somewhere on Twitter from a, a mate of theirs, whatever. And they're just like, Well, this is a person that like I can verify exists. I'm just gonna run it down. Like yeah, <laughs> and yeah. that's that's always crazy to me. That yeah. it's it's ridiculous. I mean, yeah, because I think a lot of pros don't they can't play on a main account. They they all have alt accounts because they can't do that. Yeah. Like people just basically grief them. Um I, that, that, I mean, that's that's really unfortunate because I think that being that toxic is like, how, how do you even resolve that? You know, <laughs> like, it's uh, yeah, yeah, one of those things. Um, well, what what are your favorite teams to watch? And, in, in, you know, the world, do you watch Ooh. many leagues or mostly just LCS? So I watched a lot of LCS and I was a big, big double lift fan. So I would kind oh, yeah. of follow whichever team he was on. But now he's not there. So I think the most fun team to watch for me is, is Team Liquid still. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like that organization. And so I watch all of their games. Um, and in general, I, I try and keep a tab on pretty much every LCS game now. I'm not watching every single one just because, like, I got lectures and stuff to yeah. get to. Like, Nobody has time for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I, I keep up with LCK as well. I would mm-hmm. like to watch a lot more LCK. Yeah. Um, and then LCO, which is the, the Oceanic re- mm-hmm. League at the moment, are uh, super fun to watch, man. Because I know I know a lot of the players that are in there now. I know all the guys that are just trying, like, you know, just, just starting. Um, so that's awesome fun to watch. And the match quality is, is probably a bit lower, so it's a bit more entertaining. Actually, I mean, that's that's kind of the fun of it, right? Like, watching Academy games or some of the amateur games, they're like, every game's just a banger. Like, you're seeing, like, yeah. 50 kills. Like, it's just, it's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean in in os especially because trash talking has also been incentivized yeah so like you know on, on twitter on twitter people are going in on each other like obviously most of it is is in good yeah in good yeah fun, it's banter yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah but man i think like <laughs> the the games in in os where just someone just runs it or like something crazy gets picked is is just so fun to watch as a spectator it's it's great right, i'm gonna have to check the region out um <laughs> i have noticed that the trash talk in uh in different esports is different right so i think counter-strike there's a lot of subtle trash talk but it's very like veiled and then mm-hmm. valorant it's straight in your face you know like people's We'll, we'll tweet at someone and they'll tag them and be like, you're a piece mm, of crap. Mm. Like you suck. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think it's kind of like, um, uh, like COD in that sense. But I yeah. notice in league, it's like organizations trash talking each other and all it's the all players. Memes. Everyone's yeah, supposed to I know, memes, I know. Man. Yeah, all the, yeah. all the players are actually usually very respectful. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, yeah. but yeah, I, I kind of like the, the different, the different takes on, it. I think trash talk is fun. You know, it adds drama. Yeah. It adds storyline to every game. I think it's uh it's a good thing, but uh, who do you think's the best player that you you watched or you follow a lot of? Best player currently? Yeah. Oh man, um, that is difficult. Individual player skill is is hard to know because I guess like I would want to see like what someone contributes to a team. Yeah. On, like an individual. It, it, it's such a team based of, game that's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> but but I think in terms of players like like. The, the current one that comes to mind when someone's like, who's the best player like that you're seeing at the moment? Alfari is a player because I didn't I didn't care a lot about EU. Mm-hmm. Um, I, sh- I definitely should and I yeah. do more now because it's such a good region and the mm-hmm. talent development there is also incredible. But Alfari was a player that I never really thought twice about. He looks great. He, he's looked super impressive, super consistent. Yeah. So yeah, he's, he's probably the most impressive. Well, I mean, last year uh, when he was still an origin, right? Like he was a top three top laner um mm. on a losing team which is really, yeah really yeah hard. Exactly. yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But, but yeah he's in been, the world yeah. it's a hard question he's, I, he's like, pretty I, incredible I'm, it's got to yeah. be some lpl you know like <laughs> yeah it will be uh, some some guy that's like 
just come out of LDL yeah. this year who's just like better than like 90% of the world at the game and just like yeah. oh what, what about your favorite so your favorite jungler to watch since that's kind of your favorite role. jungler to watch Ooh, um big I was big pure Shik fan watching mm, him play mm, in Korea mm, was yeah. was great um yeah that's that's probably number one and I watch a ton of his solo queue vods as well those okay. are those are incredibly interesting yeah and then here in in Ose we have Pabu and he roll swap from top to jungle so <laughs> He's, he's always fun. Uh, I think yeah, I see. I think I've seen a few of his games too. Big yeah. personality. Yeah. yeah. Vero was like not Broxa. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh look, sorry, sorry. Broxa, <laughs> awesome as well. Yeah. And very lovely on the internet. I like seeing his uh his politeness. I should yeah. watch some more Broxa. He, he's a very very nice person from what I've seen online. Um. Mm. Yeah. I I think uh it's kind of funny because he's like such a huge person, like just a big guy. But, yeah, 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 yeah. Super it's polite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I mean it's it's nice that they're. I mean obviously the trash talks fun the people who are super energetic or the cocky young rookies or whatever but having people like that that just yeah come off as genuinely lovely and, and caring is uh it's very yeah lovely. i got i got a, a great opportunity to talk with bjergsen um a couple few weeks ago and he's just genuinely i think one of the most polite nicest people i think i've ever met he's <laughs> super mm. nice um but you know for, and it's crazy because you know you basically made it to the very top of what you do and to still have that humble attitude and he was like you know his focus is just improvement it's always improvement um, yeah i think yeah. that's uh, really nice to hear and see um all right uh and then you know that was basically i think that was my last question i had written but yeah so you know in your free time, you said you like to do other stuff other than league. What do you like to do? How do you unwind, get away from gaming? Um, I love music. I okay. listen to a ton of music, um, especially like Korean, like a lot of weird indie Korean music and, and underground like hip hop and stuff. Okay. So I listen to a lot of that and I kind of, um, I don't, I don't like write about it, but I, but I take note of what I'm enjoying listening to, why I'm enjoying listening to it. And I like research the artists and stuff so that I understand because I don't speak Korean. So I want to awesome. understand like, you know, where the art's coming from and all of that. Um, I read a lot about fashion as well. I'm not a particularly fashionable guy, but I think the theory behind making clothes, making, you know, a product that, that not only, you know, helps someone live, but, um, but can be beautiful, you know, can have all of these, these features to it. That's super interesting. So yeah, I just, I just like to learn about creative stuff, I guess. That's awesome. And that's exercise. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and exercise. That, that's great. That's great. I, I didn't even get into that stuff. That's usually kind of what I highlight, but you know, how, how important do you think physical health is in terms of gaming performance and, you know, preparation at the top level? In terms of gaming performance, there were, there were people years ago that would have argued that like all the top Scots, like Starcraft pros or all the top like League of Legends <clears throat> pros back in the day were all probably like gamers that sat inside all day with smoking addictions. Mm -hmm. But I think it is just, it's just incredibly important to making this a legitimate field as opposed to, I mean, performance, is, is, is a whole other thing. I think it's it's massive for performance, but the thing that it actually does for, for esports is making it something that someone can go into without, like one, destroying their life, like, you know, just being super ill or, or unwell when retiring, but also like they can stay physically and mentally healthy while pursuing esports. I think mm -hmm. that's like just the most important thing about it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that a lot, for a lot of people, it's just even working out um, for the benefits of exercise are great, but also to just get away from the game and like focus on something else for a little bit and take your mind mm. off it. There's a ton of research on the effects that exercise has on like reaction times, you know, cognitive ability, all that stuff too. But yeah, I, I mean, it's it's really cool that you were able to separate some of those things and find interest in other things. And it actually sounds like some of the interests that you have appeal to the same sense of why you like league or like gaming you know it's like you're looking at it analytically of like why do i yeah. even like this and i so, I, I, yeah, I really I, I click with that I, i'm like that as well you know my fiance is always like like why do you get so into certain things i'm like i don't know because there's like something about it i realized that makes me interested and then i want to dive yeah. into it like <laughs> um yeah, but yeah. yeah that's awesome do you play music as well or you just just listen to it and... oh i'm totally untalented i give my i give my shower head oh you know very emotional <laughs> and uh i i play guitar sometimes but i've broken all the strings on my on my guitar trying to tune it so i buy new ones um all and right. that's that's i've been putting that off for ages <laughs> yeah i know it's like it's it's hard to keep up with stuff um our yeah. art in general is just time consuming right it's always like yeah. you're committing a large and and the problem is it's great when you're in it, right? When you're doing something creative and you're fun, it's having, you're having fun doing it. And like two hours into it, you realize, oh my God, it's been two hours. That's actually not a bad feeling. But then mm. I think before I get started, I'm always like, oh, do I really want to commit two or three hours to this? Like, 
thing, yeah i think but... getting into like a creative like flow state is yeah. super difficult yeah. like there's so many distractions around it's so easy to just mentally check out and be entertained at like a base level by the internet mm -hmm. so i've been trying to break that a lot i'm i i i'm somewhat anti-internet despite loving the internet like i you know so i think i think breaking away from from the constant distraction and actually getting into that you know you you, you spend two hours without it, it just passes you by or, or you get lost in a in a good book yeah um that feeling became kind of rare to me and so now i'm trying to chase it again that's I really interesting because i i totally agree i think that the internet and our phones and all this stuff buzzing for our attention has killed our attention span and I've noticed, you know, I, I don't know if I was, you know, I probably have had ADD since I was a kid because I'm always like that anyway, but um, it's but gotten much harder, like in this mm. last few years because of how much stuff is just inundating my attention all the time. And so things that I've had is like, I'll physically put my phone somewhere else, stuff yeah. like that, like just to get away from it. Um, absolutely. Like not having 25 browser windows up, like when I'm doing stuff is, is really important, mm -hmm. but yeah. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate you taking the time to chat today. I learned a lot about you. I, I got a really good, I think, understanding of uh, your mentality, and I'm really excited to watch the, your team continue to compete and perform. Um, is your season done then uh, for this year? No. So we have there's one more tier one tournament to qualify okay. for Proving Grounds. And then on top of that, we still have our, our C LOL like collegiate performances right. for this semester. So yeah, for now that's uh that's what I'll be working on. All right, and then I don't know what the future holds, but yeah. Well, hoping hoping you guys make it to proving grounds and get to see you come out Thanks. to LA. <laughs> mm, that'd be fun. That'd yeah, be really yeah. Good. <laughs> um, one last question here: um, If you were to give one piece of advice for climbing in solo queue, what would it be? <laughs> mm, one piece of advice, only one. Um, write down everything you do in a day because you'll stop wasting time i think i think that is the most important thing playing those empty games those ones where you don't have focus where you don't feel committed um it's hard to it's hard to notice and pull yourself out of something like that but mm -hmm. if you start taking note of everything you're doing so i played one game i played another game i lost i won um did i vote review all, all of these things and you start like, like if you don't have a framework to go off of or you don't have like an understanding of what you're currently doing mm -hmm. then it's hard to improve it and so the more you, you observe yourself and your own habits, the, the easier it'll be, become to improve, I guess. Yeah. And that's that not, sense. I wish I could just say like, yeah, play fucking AP Zin Zhao and you'll get like 2000. <laughs> but, um, and that's what a lot of players look for when they ask for coaching. They just want like, you know, make yeah. me win now. No, but, I, but I think that is, that I, is the best piece of advice. I'm a big, I'm a big believer in systems. So a new policy I've instituted for myself is I'm only going to play best of threes. Mm -hmm. um, if I win two, great. I'm done. If I lose two, I get one more chance to get some LP yeah. back. Otherwise, you know, I'm done. <laughs> you yeah, lose three yeah. in a row, you just shouldn't keep playing. Like there's <laughs> Yeah, oh stop, absolutely. You I mean I had I had a bunch of rules. Yeah. When I when I did my climb, I had a bunch of rules that I set out for myself. So mm -hmm. I would vote review every single loss, start mm -hmm. to finish. Um, I would not would would stop playing for at least three hours if I lost two games in a row. Like all of this. So yeah, yeah I think I think setting those systems up to to kind of catch yourself or, or, or yeah. you know make sure that you're actually checking yourself and your behavior is, is super important well it's just it's just crazy that you know i i've definitely experienced like the loser queue of like losing like 12 in a row you know and it just mm. feels like the games continually get on more and more unplayable and i don't know if that's mm. intentional but like you know it just feels like that and i think possibly due to tilt but also it just seems like you get lower quality games over and over like yeah. you, you'll start getting yeah. put in queues of people who are also like I, i've noticed I, I always check op.gg after and I'm in queues with like people with like 25% win rates, 30% win rates. Yeah, like, this yeah, is terrible. Their MMR is like behaving similarly, right? Yeah. But so. the, the thing that the thing that is in your control is is how much like active learning you try to do from a game. Right. And if you think about all these guys that you're getting dragged down with, and and it'll stop being your opponents as well. You'll be in like a truly cursed lobby. Yeah. Like it's good coin some of the flip. Most, yeah. <laughs> most interesting units that Solo has to offer. Yeah. But but. If if you've been doing even like a sliver of learning between games, eventually that will that will stack up high enough for you to just be absolutely destroying these guys that you're coming up against right. because it's something that that ninety nine percent of the player base is not doing. Right, that makes a lot of sense. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, good luck with the rest of your semester, and uh, I will be rooting for you guys in the next proving grounds or the next tier one. Hopefully, make it to proving grounds. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, all right, take care. Have a good rest of your day, Matt. Hey, you too. Bye. See ya. Cool.
Awesome. Well, hey, Bayora, thank you so much for tuning in for that. I uh, appreciate your comments. Um, everyone else who was able to watch, uh, great interview with him. I'm excited to see the continued development of amateur in the in NA. Really, really excited to see how hopefully the region develops over the next few years. I'd love to see better NA players come out of this region and uh, hopefully do well in the international tournaments coming up. Um, I think our next my next stream will be on Sunday. And I have, oh, I'm actually doing a live consult on Sunday with a league player. She's a streamer, goes by Mia Roki. Um, so if you follow her, she'll be on doing a consult. And then we're going to chat a little bit about mental health. She's a psycho psychology major. So once again, esports as well. So that'll be this Sunday around two. All right. See you guys. Have a good night.